This is Q on CBC Radio 1 across Canada, Sirius 137 across North America, and from PRI, Public Radio International in the United States, and Bold Television. Well, when I say the words Hollywood veteran, you might think I'm talking about someone relatively advanced in years. But in this case, I'm talking about 37-year-old actor Stephen Dorff. In his 20-year-plus career, he's packed in quite a bit. He's played transsexual superstar Candy Darling in I Shot Andy Warhol, Stuart Sutcliffe, the fifth Beatle, of course, in Backbeat, and the title role in John Waters' Cecil B. Demented. With an eclectic resume like that, it may be easy to see why Sofia Coppola cast him in the lead role of her new film, Somewhere. Once again, the Lost in Translation director set her story in a hotel, this time L.A.'s legendary Chateau Marmont, and it's from that vantage point that we spy on Johnny Marco, a gritty Hollywood star played by Stephen Dorff. Johnny Marco's life is filled with twin strippers, a Ferrari, and empty bottles of any variety. That is, until the day his ex-wife drops their 11-year-old daughter on his rented doorstep. This is a bleak, spare, modern-day paper moon, you might say, but part celebrity deconstruction and part quiet heartbreaker. And the film star, Stephen Dorff, who's basically in just about every scene in this film, is here with me now live in studio. Q, hello, sir. Hey, how are you? Thanks nice for to having you. me. Absolutely. Yeah, pleasure. And what an interesting film you've been part of. This is, this is, I, I've been looking forward to talking to you about this. I've been talking about it on the air. Let me start here. You have one of the most diverse resumes of uh, any actor I can think of. Where did Somewhere begin for you? Um, somewhere, you know, I'd, I'd kind of... Uh, a few years back, I, I tried to get... I wasn't happy with some of the films I was getting, and even though I've been very lucky along the way to uh, work with some great people and learn so much, um, I was trying to veer out of playing the villain, you know, which I kind of got stuck into doing for a while. And um, I was shooting Public Enemies with Johnny Depp shooting guns, and we were shooting that movie for about like five months or something, endless. And um, when I got home, I remember getting a call out of nowhere from my agent saying that Sophia was doing another movie. So I immediately kind of was like, what movie, you know? And uh, they sent me, uh, I was told that I, I couldn't know what the movie was about. It had something to do with me and a little girl at the Chateau Marmont. And uh, I got sent the script a couple of weeks later. Sophia called me, asked me if I'd come to Paris just to talk to her and, you know, hang out. I went to Paris. We spent about a week together, and at the end of the week, um, she gave me this role, which really, for me, uh, you know, was kind of the perfect role, I think, at the perfect time, because uh, for somebody that has done a lot of these different characters, and thank God people like you exist and you've noticed those things, um, uh, makes me feel good. Uh, I think this one was a big get for me as a person in my own life, as well as obviously professionally, somebody like Sophia backing me, embracing me when she could have had anyone, you know, uh, was a huge thing for me. Okay, let me get to the role and why it's a big get for you, but uh, three steps back. Uh, first of all, what what was it that was missing in the kind of work that you were being offered? I think just, you know, doing the villain all the time, it just feels Why are you like, always the villain? I don't know. I think it started with, uh, you know, in the beginning of my career, like movies like Power of One and Backbeat, and I started doing more vulnerable characters, and then it's kind of, I, re- I rebelled against those characters and I wanted to work with the Jack Nicholson's and all the great actors that I ended up working with but I, I think my taste was darker I liked darker movies and and I was very um, against uh, the Hollywood thing you know concept movies I remember even when I did Blade that it was going to be the end of my career and then that became kind of the most successful movie I'd done so you know I never really know and I think as an actor you don't really know I, I just I tried to mix it up but then after Blade it seemed like all I was getting was uh villains you know and if michael mann calls you to play a bank robber homer van meter of course i want right, to do that right, or, right. you know i tried with felon this little movie i produced uh, to show a little bit more vulnerability but i just couldn't get that and it took this woman sophia and one of my favorite filmmakers to kind of say well maybe there's a sweeter side to steven a little bit underneath this flawed guy i thought you were going to say it all started with the aerosmith video <laughs> When you were the villain to Alicia Silver, yeah, Silverstone. Yeah, when she punches right? me, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. since then, you've been a villain. I to, think so, yeah. To, You're right. To, to fans of Clueless and uh, <laughs> me everywhere. Uh, I, I'll never forget that video. I mean, that's a generational yeah. thing for most of us. For those of us who remember that, we remember that. It was crying, by the way, for those listening who want to identify Stephen Dorff from a music video. He was in that with Elisa Silverstone, that iconic video. But it got pretty bad for you. This, I mean, I read somewhere that you said I, I felt like I didn't want to do it anymore. You, it, you, before this film coming along, you, you were actually questioning being an actor. Yeah, I think it just gets hard. You know, it gets hard if you're not 
you know, if you're not in control of your own destiny, it's kind of a weird feeling, you know? So, like, it's, as an actor, I'm really an actor for hire, really. I mean, I, I have to pick the movie I want to do. I have to obviously like it. I have to feel inspired. But um, at a certain point when that movie ends, there is a kind of a loneliness that comes in between. And uh, I think for any performer, whether you're in a band or an artist or an actor or a photographer and musician, um, and I think that's what Johnny Marco's going through in the film. I think we're in between his life. Somewhere he's gotten very lost and he's a broken man inside, even though on the surface he seems to have everything. When you get offered this role by Sofia Coppola to play an emotionally lost male, it, the film takes place in a hotel. Once we see the film, we know it's not exactly lost in translation, but did you, were you concerned at all that you would be drawing comparisons to Bill Murray and his masterful role in that film? I mean... You know, that movie was so great, and it was just like my favorite movie of the year. And, uh, I mean, Bill Murray was just incredible in that film. And, uh, you know, I think people compare this film a little bit, just the obvious, it isn't a hotel again. But I think the film is totally different. You know, I think our relationship, me and Al Fanning, is a much different story than, than an older movie star that's going through his own crisis of his own. But, you know, I mean, obviously there are some similarities, but I think Sophia really thinks of the films as being very different. You aren't worried about it. I wasn't, no. To play this role, you move back into the, the Chateau Marmont. I say back because you actually lived there when you were 21, just after you scored a role playing the fifth Beatle in Backbeat. Did returning there bring back any old ghosts for you? Um, you know, the place hasn't changed much. That's the, kind of the beauty of it. But as a young guy, when I, when I went there, whether it was for my 21st birthday or when I did check in after Backbeat, I, I didn't have an apartment you know, it was so cool. I didn't want to go back to my parents. I wanted to have my... I thought I had a little money. I'd check in. And then I ran out of money because I stayed there for about a month and I had to check out. But uh, get another movie. But, um, you know, it, the place hasn't changed much. I mean, there's obviously new generations of people, but it's still one of these weird kind of creative uh, dorm rooms in a weird way. You know, it's like even when we were shooting the movie, you have Baz Luhrmann and all these directors checking in and Alfonso Cuaron looking over and wondering how we're shooting a movie in the hotel and thinking, are they doing a documentary? Actually, no, we're shooting a movie on 35 millimeter. We're shooting on film. We're shooting in a way people don't shoot anymore. You know, it was, it was pretty exciting how she covertly just went in there and made this film. And how would you characterize your time at the Chateau Marmont as a 21-year-old? I mean, for me, it was just an exciting place because I feel like the Chateau is this iconic place. Obviously the stories that are the most famous from John Belushi and some of the darker stories that have happened, but also just as a atmosphere, as it has this magical kind of uh, thing. And I would always kind of want to hang out at the Chateau more than say the Four Seasons or the Beverly Hills Hotel because for me it was like what was going to happen. Was Helmut Newton going to be over there shooting pictures in the corner of these beautiful girls? Was Mick Jagger going to be having a beer out on the patio? You know, it's just such a decade in place that it kind of as an actor as a young person wanted to be an actor so bad um that's where i wanted to get was to. it a party for you it was a party on my 21st birthday and we <laughs> ended up we ended up in the pool we, we ended up in the pool where i do that scene in the movie but um yeah it was a party it was also a time where i didn't realize that i had to pay taxes so i think i realized that if i made a certain amount of money that was all mine and i hadn't didn't know the concept at 19 of well you have to pay your representatives, you have to pay the government, and then you're left with this amount. Right. So it was something I learned in my uh, haphazard kind of youth. But I had a great time, and it's still a party there. I, I mean, mean, I'll tell you why I asked the question about whether it's a party. Because, Stephen, uh, I mean, this character you're playing, Johnny Marco, is a... He, he's a he's a womanizer. He's got this. Uh, you might even say seedy side. Uh, Sofia Coppola has said that she cast you because she knew you had a reputation for being out and about with girls, and that you also had a sister around Cleo's age. Uh, are you comfortable with having your real life mixed into a character like that? I mean, it's always weird, you know. Luckily, I don't think I've had the the invasion as certain other performers have, you know, when you're, when you certain amount of fame brings, you know, I've, I've never been chased, you know, a lot by paparazzi. You know, luckily I've had this more mysterious career, but at the same time it's happening more and more, I think. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's just part of the gig, right? You know, if I go out with a girl and I'm photographed, um, you know, people, you develop a reputation. I think partly because I didn't marry young, I, I went out with a lot of girls and I sure. <laughs> developed a reputation, but I, um, I think as I get older, I've I've grown up a lot. I want to, 
I'd love to settle down and have kids of my own. I think now I'm older, there's all these kids around me. I have better relationships with young people than I've ever had with a a girl my own age. So it's very weird. So somebody's trying to tell me something. Well, be, <laughs> well are you, were you concerned, though, that people will think this is you? I mean, I, I was watching you guys uh, do the question and answer at the Venice Film Festival when, when the film premiered there. And the first question that somebody asks is, who is Johnny Marco? Like, mm. kind of cheekily asking it of you, suggesting that you are Johnny Marco. Does that concern you? I mean, it couldn't be further from the truth. That's the only thing. I mean, I think as a performer, it's me performing Johnny Marco, but I felt like I had to lose a big part of Stephen to play Johnny Marco, you know? Even though I have a half-sister and I told Sophia about it, I I don't know what it's like to be a father. I've never had that responsibility. I, um, I'm just learning what it's like to take care of myself in, in the last few years, you know, uh, through personal um, reasons and just caught things that made me grow up, you know, in my own life. Uh, but I think um, I think uh, I think it's been an incredible growing experience. I mean, I'd, I'd love to uh, uh, I'd love to have a family at some point, you know. Johnny Marco is conflicted in his relationships with women. In one scene, he's watching these strippers dance in his hotel room. They regularly pop by. In another, he's watching his daughter's figure skating routine. The film is largely shot in sequence too. So, what was it like living that juxtaposition for you? Well, the first, like, 20 minutes of the film, I really wanted to live hard as the character. I always have a problem in movies when you, when actors are waking up in the morning. I always find it fake, even when women are pouting or doing the lip thing when they're waking up. or, You know, it's hard to kind of act tired. So I felt like I needed to tell Sophia that I wanted to live the character. So I kind of went pretty hard in the beginning and lived him. You know, I lived like a guy that woke up at 3 in the afternoon and hadn't been out in the sun in a while. And... He's a bit of a train wreck in his personal yeah. life. You know, what, he, what does that mean, you went hard? I just stayed up all night. Right. I drank too much. I, I wanted to wake up cloudy, you know. Uh, so I, I lived the part, you know. And then, and then I think when it comes to the ice skating scene, I look at that scene, I love that scene. And I love that scene because it's the first time I think he can see his daughter through the fog, you know. That's at least what I tried to. And he sees that, God, she's grown a lot. God, she's three years older, where have I been for the last three years mm. since this decadent lifestyle, you know, entered my life, since I became this massive movie star from the Berlin Agenda or whatever these funny movies are that he's become famous for. But I think uh, that's a beautiful scene because it's the first time he really goes from the Blackberry and the way we move in life, everything's moving so fast, everything's, you know, we're all consumed with you know, our own personal life, things are moving, information viral over the internet, that Sophia just kind of slows everything down. And this guy, for the first time, just can see his daughter. And that's where I think slowly it starts to change. She certainly has the courage as a filmmaker, again, to take time with shots. We'll watch, I mean, that figure skating sequence is remarkable. It's your face watching your daughter, Cleo, uh, in the film, uh, uh, do this figure skating routine for about five minutes, just yeah. two shots, that's yeah. it, right? Uh, but but back to this juxtaposition, with the, from the strippers to the to figure skating, and yeah. what, what, do, what do you think this says about men's relationship with or idea of women? Well, I think Sophia was, when she was thinking about writing this movie, she's explained that she had... Um, she was homesick from L.A., living in Paris and having her first baby. And I think she a big question in her head is like, you know, when you have a kid, it makes you change. It makes you think differently. You know, is Johnny going to be this 80-year-old guy in the nightclub? You know, is he really going to head that way or is he going to come to an awakening, you know? And I think that's where it started for her, from what she explains. And and I think Johnny wants more than that, you know? So it was kind of, a, for me, it was a, a balance of a very, you know, a guy on the surface that, um, has everything, you know, he has everything you'd want, he has all the candy, but if you were a kid and you're eating candy all day, you know, how does that make you feel after? You start to feel a little sick after so much candy, you're going to get a sugar buzz, but after a while, it's, you can't live off candy. And so I think in her way, when she explained that to me, I seemed to start to get what the heart of this film was, which was really about an adolescent father becoming a man, really, mm. in the heart. And it's... You know, it's a guy that has so much, yet he, he needs to be somewhat sweet, I think, and soulful underneath so that you root for him. Because you could easily look at a guy like this. Well, why do I care about him? He's not dying of cancer. He's got all this stuff. He's got a Ferrari, the suite. He's got money. He's got so many supermodels throwing themselves, flashing them. But at the end of the day, I mean, uh, 
that isn't everything. You know, you can have a lot of money, you can have a lot of things if you if you have something broken inside and you don't deal with it. That money ain't gonna cure it. The more sex ain't gonna cure it. So it's I thought it was interesting what she was playing with, especially in a time where fame and uh, materialism and all these things seem very important to okay. a lot of people. Okay, let me stop you there. You, you, yeah. didn't, you didn't actually answer my question about women, but you said so many interesting things. I'm sorry. That, <laughs> that, that I'll pick up on what you did say. Because uh, I've asked it twice now, and you, you don't want to go there. They, Which they, one? Well, I was just me. asking no, about the relationship me. with women. What, what, what do you think? What's, what's the commentary in terms of man's think, view of women when we watch scenes of him watching these strippers in his room? and then Yeah, he's him, barely awake to last through the performance, you know, because he's so tired all the time. But, I mean, I think, I think he's looking for a fix from these women, you know, and he's not happy. I think probably the two people that know him most are Layla, his ex, and Cleo. And I think since Layla, he's been... You know, women are just throwing themselves at him. He, you know, almost doesn't even want to have sex. It almost becomes a chore for him, yet he's completely alone. I think, I'm sure it's ego. I'm sure it's that self-gratifying uh, quick fix, but right. ultimately he's emptier. Well, he's empty and he's numb. So, I mean, in, in as much as this film is a meditation on celebrity... So Johnny Marco is this A-list action star, also a tragic character in the sense that he's so disaffected and numb, as you say, towards almost everything around him. He's bottled up emotionally and immature in that sense. Do you think there's a relationship between celebrity and that numbness? Yeah, 100%. Do I you think. relate to that? Totally. I mean, I was, I felt, you know, I've never been, I got it more together now than Johnny Marco, thank God. But... Um, there are times in my life, goes back to that question of why I didn't want to do it anymore, you know, as an artist or an a actor. I mean, if you can't be inspired to do what you want to do, I mean, whether you're a painter, a musician, you know, it, it's very difficult to uh, to be happy because I don't go to an office every day. I don't get to come here and do the next story or the next radio show. You know, it, it's it's kind of like dating a girl for two years, making a movie, and then it ends, you know, and the no phones ringing until the next person and it's it's lonely you know i i'm not at the chateau but i sit in my house after a movie like somewhere and i'm i'm depressed what do i do next i miss al fanning can i call al or is that weird because i'm not a real dad she has a dad is this a little strange but then i say you know i'll call her anyway and i call her and i say hi al i miss you we got into venice oh that's so cool click you know and it's a little weird but i was missing sophia i was i told sophia if we ever work together again i said could we shoot a movie like michael mann shoots his where we can shoot for five months because i just had so much fun with this family on this one that it was kind of so sad. the numbness isn't when you're doing the work the numbness is in between the work i think so yeah because I, I think it's gratifying when you're performing but does it also come from the hedonism right of of, of having it all thrown at you sophia coppola has said and i'm quoting her i was curious if you're in a non-stop partying lifestyle with girls and drugs and all what's it like in the morning do you take a moment to reflect when you're alone with yourself what's your answer to that question i think you do because I think the longer that, that, that cycle is spinning, the more detached you are, the more you have to hear that voice or you're really in trouble. Because I think when you hear about all these famous people and, and really talented people with big careers going downhill and crashing and burning finally, it's probably because they never dealt with that. They didn't have a Cleo like I do in this film to rescue me in a weird Who way. Who is your Cleo outside of the film? Or do you have one? I think my mom was my Cleo. My mom was such a great... Uh, I credit my mom a lot these days now that I don't have her anymore looking back because she was a very protective mother, you know, almost to the point where I, well, to the point where I rebelled against it when I first started making movies and I was traveling and I wanted to do, you know, mo you know, intense movies and art movies. And, you know, I think my mom protected me to a point where the reason I never went over the edge or there's never been any true Hollywood story about me being arrested and, you know, is because of my parents, because I'm lucky enough to have had a, a real good family. If I didn't have that backbone, I think I would have been screwed. Your mother died around the time you got this part. Yeah, a year before. And yeah. she, she once said you would play a flawed ladies' man with heart. Uh -huh. why, why do you think she would say that? I don't know. My mom had this crazy obsession. I think if she hadn't married my dad, she would have been a stalker for Steve McQueen because she always loved Steve McQueen, and I don't know why, but she always thought I reminded her of Steve McQueen. And you know, in, in kind of my later years after I grew up, I was watching a lot of Steve McQueen movies, and I really started liking McQueen because he had like this, he was a real man, you know. He had like, there's something about um, 
his rawness that he could be flawed he you know but then at the same time you'd believe him you'd know he'd protect the girl you'd know he'd kind of rise up to the occasion at the end and and it's weird my mom didn't say i was going to play a character like this but it's definitely a little strange that in a year that um it was a very empty time for me, and I hadn't felt a connection to her to be in Paris and then receive this offer from Sophia at the same time as feeling my mother um, being happy for the first time. I, you know, it was it just hit me in a way that getting a part had never hit me before. So you have to kind of believe in that when that happens, and, and I do believe that my mom was saying, here's a great one for you. Finally, you're not going to have people run out of the theater scared, you know, for their lives, you know, we can actually maybe start to like you again. And, and so like, I, you know, I feel like in my work in the future, I want to try to do that. I want to think about, you know, I try to listen when I'm in trouble. I, I listen to my mom's voice. I hear her and I do try to do the right thing, make her proud. I mean, if I let her down now, I think, uh, I'd get in real trouble. So uh, <laughs> I got to become a better, uh, I'm just trying to do things that I think she would, uh, want me to do and it's nice to feel uh, like I'm getting older it's about time I'm 37 so I can't be a kid forever you know? okay on that note on the can't be a kid forever note yeah Johnny Spence how, how, how do I have five more minutes you guys you yeah got go a, for 20 it. people there with on your team okay one yeah. of the best guys I mean one of the best interviews and you understand the movie better than anyone so we should give we should give him 50 more minutes <laughs> well, thank cancel you. the rest of the afternoon <laughs> I'm hanging much. in here I just okay. need five more you're saying things that just are sp sparking things in me that I want to talk about yeah uh, Johnny spends his days uh, playing video games uh, uh, chasing girls driving his fast car these function almost as distractions mm. from real life yeah. although in the case of say video games I think a lot of people listening might be able to relate to that too. Do you do you think living in such constant distraction creates the conditions where we exist in a kind of prolonged adolescence? That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think I think so. It also kind of detaches you if you spend your whole day in front of um, anything. You kind of maybe lose contact with people, your relationships and things, and it does isolate you. I mean, I, as far as the adolescence thing. You know, I want to be a great father in my own life, you know, and, and I think where Johnny's going, by the end, it's his beginning. I think he will be a great dad, first and foremost. But I'd like to keep, as Stephen, a, a sense of uh, adolescence, too, but not as extreme as Johnny. You know, I don't want my kids taking care of me. I want to, I want to be a great father to them. At the same time, um, I think it's important to keep a youth and to keep a what I've had so much fun with, with my little sisters, or whether it's Sophia's daughter on the set, is is being my youth kind of makes them like me and so there's a there's a fine line with I see I, I see and you're, you're, you're I'm looking in the mirror I, I know what you're talking about because I'm also unmarried and and I don't have kids either and yeah. I, have a, I have a niece and I feel like I can you know but but when do you know how to walk when do you know and when do you know how to walk away from that adole that prolonged adolescence to stop with the distractions mm. To, I think, to, yeah. to, to be what in would in an old school way would be called pulling it together and being responsible. You know, I think that's got to come from within. It's like almost like a self changing thing. You know, I don't. I don't know. I don't. But know you're when. not married. I'm not. So man. when? It, <laughs> <laughs> so that hasn't come from within. I don't you? even have a girlfriend. Right. I, I'm, I'm lonely, man. <laughs> you're numb. It's between yeah. films. You're I calling got the best movie I've members. ever done, and I still am looking for a girlfriend. <laughs> I got the uh, I got the girls from Alliance trying to invite some girls to the premiere tonight to help me out. But uh, no, um, the truth is I don't know. I, I'd like to have a family because I think part of that loneliness that occurs in between gigs would probably go away. I notice how Sophia and Tomar are doing it. Her her boyfriend, they have two kids. He's in one of the most successful rock bands, Phoenix, and yet after the movie ends, she gets to go home and she has to be a mom. There's a crazy responsibility. Like I look forward to that because that then will become my job, right? So when the movie ends, I don't have to worry about the agent calling or finding the next best movie or are the Coen brothers doing a new one or is Sophia doing a new one. I can go and deal with my, my children. But it's not, it, it wouldn't be that hard for you to find somebody, would it? No, I just think I mean, this is the, the, it's got to find the right one. I don't want to have a baby the way people get a cup of coffee these days, you know, either. I kind of like that I haven't done that yet. Well, it depends. It's some, coffee's hard to get. If you hey, want really good, good coffee. Good, really good coffee. But you know what but, I mean? I'd like to hope that it's going to try to work and you're going to be a family unit. Sure, but me, what I'm touching on is what she also talked about in terms of this this uh, this film is in terms of the emptiness of celebrity narrative and as much as we see that in the, this film, that's not new. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, you got to know that people are going to watch this and go so women are throwing themselves at throwing themselves at him he drives a ferrari and he parties all the time what i i wouldn't mind that kind of emptiness 
That doesn't seem so bad, right? right? Yeah. What uh, do you say to those people? I think uh, that emptiness, though. Poor but that, little rich boy. Yeah, you know? but I think that will fade at a certain point, you know? I mean, that is not what's the most important thing. I mean, look, I learned about that. I went to school in L.A. and where materialistic things were the most important thing. I was pissed that... I didn't get dropped off in a Bentley. Why? Looking back, it's ridiculous. But it's because all the other kids I was going to school with came from this insane amount of privilege. Now, looking back, I realize, wow, I was lucky to just have my dad had written a couple hit songs. We grew up in a comfortable situation. You know, I think for people that look to him and say, I'd like to have that emptiness, hope, I, I don't know if they really understood the, the, the movie then, because I think all that is fine and dandy, and I've had all that my whole life, but... Uh, it's taken some major things to have happened in my life, like loss, to really figure out my life. You, you know? are an L.A. guy. Yeah. And you say that Sophia has nailed Los Angeles in that film mm. in a way that you've never experienced before. What, what did she get right about Los Angeles? I just think everything from the, you know, she's gotten the chateau so right from just the sounds of the sounds of the hotel to the way the hotel smells, the, you know, what it's like for an actor to go get a head cast, which any actor can identify with that if they've done a comic book movie or anything like a drama where you have to age. It's a weird experience, you know. Anything like, uh, you know, driving around L.A., the brightness of the sun, you know, um, the isolation of almost like it's a fairy tale place to live, valet parking, sunny weather every day, no seasons, yet you can be incredibly lost and be living in a little hotel room, too, in L.A. You know, it feels like American Gigolo and Shampoo sometimes, I feel like, movies that she wanted to emulate as far as a feeling of L.A., and I think we did, because, you know, lately we've seen Entourage, we've seen a lot of shticky L.A. We don't really get to really see the character study in L.A., where L.A. is almost a background. Like, I love all the driving shots on the freeways. I love just the ambiance of what she created, you know? Nicely done. I, I, let me end where I began, talking, okay. talking about your resume. You're someone who's known to us as working in a lot of alternative, uh, alternative kind of films, I would say, you know? I don't want to say indie films, because Blade isn't exactly a little tiny film. But, but you know, you're, you're always kind of left of center in a lot of the films you've done. And yet you've worked with an impressive array of uh, the top guys, the major league actors, Jack Nicholson, Dennis Hopper, Harvey Keitel, soon Johnny Depp. Is there a part of you... Stephen Dorff, that wonders what your life would be like if you had pursued a more mainstream acting career. Yeah, it's weird. I think, uh, you know, because there was definitely those opportunities after movies like Backbeat and, you know, there was a chance where I could have... I did a movie called SFW with Reese Witherspoon, which was, uh, you know, a pretty cool movie But when I was younger, but again, kind of aggressive, more of a Generation X. I was listening to a lot of Nirvana. Kurt Cobain was a big influence to me. His death really affected me, I think because of my generation, he was really the guy I felt mm -hmm. that was doing something different. And, and um, You know, and I, I don't know, if I had taken certain movies that I was offered and stuff, I probably would have had a much bigger bank account, I much, but I probably would have screwed everything up. You know, in a way, I maybe, maybe I was meant to have to have the career that I've had in a way by not being the center so much. It allowed me to learn, it allowed me to figure things out to where I am now. I'm stepping up in more of that centered spot, and and I think maybe I'm ready to deal with it better. You know, I'm more respectful, I think, to people. I'm able to listen more. I'm not jumping off the walls. I'm, uh, you know, I'm more into my work too, and I think I'm better actor than I was before. Even though I know I loved what I did before, I'm learning more. You know, learning by challenges like this. So you can't really look back. I mean. I was offered a lot of big movies that people would be like, are you crazy? Why didn't you do it? You know, I you know, said, well, it was probably the same reason Al Pacino didn't do what he was probably offered. And De Niro, right. you can't really look back. You have to kind of go with, you know, I grew up in the movies. It's a weird lifestyle, you know, and in a way I made it, I made it through okay. Now I want to start really cracking, you know, and, I'm, and I want to take... Uh, the center stage, and I want to take it in more. You main want to be that mainstream. Well, I want to star. I want to. I want to do good movies. You know, I don't really want to do. You know, Transformers Part Four. I want to be in like, but I wouldn't mind being in a big Hollywood movie that that says something or that gives me the opportunity. You know, it's weird. Indie. Part of the problem is that the big Hollywood movie is Transformers Four. Well, there really, <laughs> there really isn't any. Yeah, like for me, yeah. yeah. You know, I'd love to do a, a movie with Quentin Tarantino, work with a, another great writer director right. like Sophia. I mean, that's my heart is you know make movies about people. But if uh, if I can get the chance to work with Michael Mann or Oliver Stone again, you know, these are all filmmakers that I look really look up to. 
By the way, Michael Mann should be sending you a, a, a Christmas bottle or something. You've mentioned him four times, I think. Yeah. You're like a promo for Michael Mann. I know, Michael You've mentioned Mann. him more than the film. You're I in. know, jeez. You, you'll, you, I'm owed <laughs> by Michael, yeah. <laughs> I understand your next role is playing the part of uh, Dick Shadow in an upcoming Adam Sandler movie, Born to be a Star. Yeah, Seems Adam. Like apropos for what we're talking about. <laughs> what can you tell me about that? Adam wrote and, uh, and produced this movie, and he's been a friend of mine for a long time, and he always looked up to the movies I was doing. Like, he always said, hey, I was Public Enemies. I said, oh, it's great, man. You know, how are those comedies you're doing? I want to do a comedy. I, I don't want to kill people all the time and rob banks. And, and he's like, I got it, Dorf. I got the part. And I guess he... Um, his company's doing so much producing now, but he had, he had written this movie and uh, was producing it and wrote a great part and gave it to me. And uh, it kind of feels like a, an early Farrelly Brothers movie, like Kingpin. It's I got kind of the Bill Murray part in Kingpin. It's kind of a very funny look into the porn world, but totally Sandlerized. If anything, it's like Happy Gilmore <laughs> set in Granada Hills. <laughs> but you're not a villain. I'm not, I mean, he's a comedic villain. He's a, I could, I, you know, he, he's got a little bit, he's, he's not the sweetheart that you're rooting for. You're rooting for the buck tooth guy, Nick Swartzen's character, and Christina Ricci is in it, and Don Johnson. It's pretty wacky. But that's coming out Easter, and then I did this, uh, this crazy big 3D, uh, talk about commercial, tentpole kind of movie. Hopefully it'll, it'll, um, it'll come out good, uh, called Immortals, which is, um, it was a great cast, like Mickey Rourke and Frida Pinto, and, John Hurd and all these really great, uh, great actors, and you know I never know how those movies are going to be, but I think Tarsem, who directed it, is very talented and will make a pretty cool 3D movie out of it. It's nice we'll to see. It's nice to have you here, man. Hey, man, it's nice to be back. I'll come back here for sure. Yeah, you you must. Uh, and and welcome back to Canada, and we'll congrats on this film, and hope to, hope to see you again. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, liking it. Stephen Dorff. He plays Johnny Marco in Sofia Coppola's new film, Somewhere. And Stephen Dorff has been with me here live in Studio Q.